Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Woodworking Wisdom. I'm Jason. So we're going to continue a little bit from where we left off yesterday. A couple of things, though. Frederick, quite an easy one for you. It's an electrical braking system. Anything that has a variable speed unit will have an electrical braking system. So even the lathe we have here has an electrical braking system. And then me and Colwyn obviously seem to advance that a little bit more by slowing the chuck down with our hands. Probably not a good thing, but... OK, but it will be an electrical braking system. Got another question. We're going to wait a minute for that, though. We'll do that in a sec. So today we kind of said we're going to look at things like the chucks, face plate holding, different ways of getting the best out of what you have. First thing I do, going to go right back to bag sets again. So chucks, I'm just looking for my pencil. So on the board down on here, I've got three chucks. Now we make our own chucks and centers, obviously, in town. We've designed this. This has been going over 25 years. So a long time that we have done a chuck system. Three chucks we do. We do an 80 mil diameter, 100, 115. Okay. So different sizes depending on what you have. They all have a scroll method. So if I turn the scroll on here, I'll drop this round a bit. I can open and close the jaw system. Now, at the moment, the chucks have got no jaws on. So the block that we have in here, the H shape, if you can see that nicely, I think on there, is classed as a mounting jaw. So the 80 and the 100 mil have a slightly shorter mounting jaw. The 114, slightly longer, but actually any of the mounting jaws are interchangeable. So I could take the 100 mil and put them into the 114. They will still fit, all right? Newer things on the chuck that have changed a little bit. I'm just going to turn this over, see if we can see down in here. And what I'm probably going to do, I'm going to reach up, just zoom the camera in, and then bring that back. Down inside there, you can see there's a little grub screw. I'm just going to put the Allen key on top of it there. Now, if we undo that grub screw and take it out, I can actually take the mounting jaws totally out the chuck body so at the moment that's a retaining screw quite an important part for you to understand that there is a screw down in there that will stop the mounting jaws coming out the chucks you don't have to take the mounting jaws out the mounting jaws are all numbered now there is oh what should we go with I'm gonna wind this out just so we can try and show you on the end of the mounting jaws if you did swap them over there is a number engraved down on here. It matches what's on the chuck body. Bring that back a bit. That's better. Number two. This will be number two. All right. So if you try and keep that system the same, it's worth doing. It helps you if you do take things in and out. They go in an anti-clockwise sequence, one to four. So one, two, three, four. All right. So that's quite basic stuff. There is 30 two different types of jaws that you can put onto our chucks different sizes and that's quite an amazing thing so to give you an idea of difference between i've got a set of bf grippers which are small ones i've got big colossus grippers which are six inch diameter so massive difference between something really tiny in the middle here right up to something a lot bigger so there's different jaws for different size things so let's just put that back out the way. I'm going to lose these. And again, if you've got questions on any of this, let's have them. We'd love to hear from them. If you've got questions from things we did yesterday, we'd like to know. I'm just going to get in one of the chucks we're going to use today. I need to make sure it's the right thread to go on the lathe. So I'm just going to bring you back in just a little bit. And I've got to move the chuck about. Let's see where we are. That's better. I want to put some jaws on here. We're going to need these in a minute. So number four will go on. And like I said, there's, I think it's 32 different types of jaws that you can bolt onto the chuck system. It makes it incredibly versatile. Just that time I'm impatient, I've got an Allen key I can use on my cordless drill. Speed things up. So that's number four. Let's take the key out before we drop it. Turn the torque down a little bit. Four. Number one. We'll put those on. So this gives you an idea of how quick and easy it will be to change your jaws. I'll bring that to there. I'm just going to come out a little bit. Give me room. Ben's got his arm up. So in a minute, let me just do these, Ben, and then we'll get to your question. We'll get all four done. Let's 
uh, cross threading it. So I've got to be a little bit careful when I start doing it with the drill. I'm really doing this because it saves quite a bit of time. I'm not really impatient. Number three and a couple more of those. Okay, so we've got our jaws on there. I'm going to put that back out there because I'm going to want it in a minute. So we've got four on there. One, two, three, four. Great. Okay. Mounting jaws on these. This is the 114 mounters. So if I bring this out, the jaws we've got on are really designed for the 100 mil accessories, but they will still fit on the 112 mil chuck. The mounting jaws are a little bit wider. They come out that's why we've got a curved edge on these now instead of being a nice square corner so if you do catch this when it's spinning your knuckles tend to bounce off instead of being torn apart a little bit a little bit softer okay but ideally we want to use the chuck within the range of where it's safe to use those jaws which we're going to look at in a second we're going to put those behind us we're going to want those in a minute right ben's got a question but before he does his I'm going to answer one from yesterday. Dances with Ardbark asked me yesterday, do we do a smaller, shorter, which really the, the word that I missed a bit, revolving tailstock centre. Now, the smallest one we do is a mini live. So this is a revolving centre. We do it on a one more taper. So, yes, it is there, but it has a 90-degree cone instead of a 60. To give you the reference of difference in length, if I can get my hand right, Bring it back. Quite a bit smaller. Okay. So I expect you're about 15, 20 mil shorter in length. So you gain a bit more length between your centers. It's also smaller section in diameter, which means that you get more access. So that can be a good one to go with. All right. Just going to lay those down there. I can bring camera back a bit again. Right. Ben, what have you got? So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got a question here from the Wizen Chef. Um, he has the AC305 um, wood turning lathe. Um, which would be the best chuck to purchase? I'd probably go with a hundred mil. Um, I actually like the hundred mil chuck. Why? So Ben, let's just have a quick. Okay, it's smaller, a little bit lighter. All our chucks are single key operated, not two Tommy bars. If it's two Tommy bars, you have two bars to hold to move it, and the wife or someone has to come and hold the bowl. So a single key is so much easier to operate. 100 mil, very versatile, lots of stuff there. Just a little bit lighter than the bigger chuck in weight. So I would go with that. All right, so hopefully that gives you a good idea on that one. There's uh, the chuck packages with that, which we're going to explain a little bit as we go through what we're going to look at now. Ben? And Michael would like to know, are the thread sizes printed on the chucks? They are, which is actually... <laughs> Um, I had some fun the other week. Um, I don't know if you can see on there. Ben's looking curiously. There's a T23 down on here. That relates to a number of the threads. And they've been there for quite a few years of different thread sizes. T23 fits a Nova. It is inch and a quarter by something, which is very similar to 33 by 3.5. But it won't screw on. And I gave it to a guy in here the other week on a training session. And he looked at me for five minutes trying to put this on the lathe. And it wasn't until I went back and read it and I went, I've given you the wrong chuck. So it won't fit. OK, so it's quite important. Yes, the thread sizes do tend to be on the chucks as a number. They relate to what's possibly in the catalogue or on the web. OK, Ben? Good. Right. So centres out the way. So hopefully dancers with our bike will be happy. There is one more tape on that. Now, I'm going to go to here a second. Let's move the pin back. I'm going to take the board just out the way for a minute. I kind of said to you, it's important to try and get the right size jaws for what you're doing. And I'm hoping this is going to work. I've been doing it about a good way of trying to do this. So I've just closed those C jaws down. I'm going to spin the chuck. Now, actually, if you look at them, I don't know if it appears on the camera quite right, they tend to wobble at that stage. Now, I just used a marking pen. I want to put this inside. Going to clamp down to it. We've got very little gap now between the jaws. 
And I mean very little. It would probably hold it. I can't pull it out. I'm going to take it out. Okay. One. I'm going to try now. That way. Again, same marker pen. I'm trying to get a line of black just on the inside to give you an indication of what's happening if we do this. And this is any chuck. There. Last bit to do. And I'm hoping you understand the relevance of this, why I'm doing this for you, because this can cause you real problems. Now, any chuck will have a lot of movement. I could probably go a little bit bigger than where we are, put the cap back on the pen. We pinched on those, let's take that. Okay. Now, Ben, let's just have a look on the overhead. Now, this is extending the jaws out beyond the size of where they're machined. So, in reality, the C jaws are machined in one true circle. They then quarter them. When they quarter them, they take about a quarter of an inch out in between the jaws. Now, if you look at what we have on here, I'm hoping you can see little black dots. That's my grip area. That to there. So in actual fact, on the C jaws with where I've got moat now, I'm gripping just in the corner points. Nothing in between. So I get a bit of grip there, a bit there, right there. So again, we're not touching. We go to this. Look at the surface contact on here. All the way around. Nice long line. So that's actually where those jaws are machined. So we're actually hitting a true circle. If we go smaller, again, we're touching actually just on the center of the curvature of the middle of those shorts. So what I'm trying to get over for you is, yes, one set of jaws will have quite a lot of movement on coming out and in, but it's paramount that you actually are trying to aim for a true circle to get maximum grip, support. You can imagine, I kind of said to you, touching on four little corner points, you're not getting a lot of support behind it. The work might vibrate. You'll get more vibration for it. So try and aim for a true circle. Um, we print all the sizes on the web and in the catalogue. They are there. Quite good to try and aim for those sizes as a guide point. There is even the speed sizer, which you can use with a tailstock point and a pencil. So that goes through. I think Colwyn's covered that the other month. So we can bring that up, put it on, draw a pencil line through. Look at it that way. Do your line. Okay. Just have a look on four, Ben. That's good. So this will bring up your tailstock mark in the center when you've got your bowl on and draw your line. So that can be possible to use. Try and aim for a true circle. You're going to get a lot more grip, a lot more support. Okay. Now, see jaws, what we've got in the chuck. When we do the chuck packages and the guy that asked about what's the best chuck to go with flat lay, we do a chuck package that would fit that. You could have Screw chuck, face plate ring. You'll understand the relevance of those in about five minutes. The C jaws we tend to put with the chuck packages because they're still the most versatile jaws there. They cover quite a good range of sizes for what we're going to do. So we just said a few magical words. You could have face plate ring. Now, the advantage we're using face plate ring, and again, from my points of holding stuff, or even things like coal went done, you'll see a few things we use. Face plate rings regularly on things here. These are things that have been hung up on the wall in here. You guys have all seen these. You've been watching. You've got his phone backboard, his sanding pad. So we regularly use those with faith plate rings. Why? They're lighter in weight. So don't take up so much weight. They're not as heavy to put on the lathe, if you like. Easier to store because they're thinner. They're cheaper to buy. You can have four or five for the price of a normal faith plate. All you do with those is load them into the chuck by closing the jaws down, expanding it out. So if I make jig boards or anything I want at home, I will use a fake plate ring. Makes my life a lot easier, a bit cheaper. Things like the Eccentric Chuck that Colwyn used Tuesday use exactly the same wrist system. In reality, you have a face plate ring on the back. It is designed to fit into the sea jaws. Okay? Now I'm trying to be quite quick because we've got a lot of stuff to get through. Get the thing out of the box. And one thing I regularly see, and I hate, most taper centers being put into the center of a set of chuck jaws. The problem with this, you're going to start to mark the middle. You're going to bear it up a little bit, holding it in the jaws. 
that's going to damage the center. You will then damage your Morse taper a little bit. So there's a better thing for that. There is actually a drive center that fits directly into the chuck that tightens up. All right, so that actually gives you the aspect that you can hold that directly in the middle of the chuck, but you're working without having to take the chuck off. Can be nice and quick. There is also this thing, a Morse taper carrier. So this does two Morse taper that will go in. I can wiggle it a bit. That allows, allows me to load a number of different drive centers if you like, but something a bit unusual for most of us. Next question I've had with this when I worked in the shop was, how do you get the meal? There you go. Quick and easy. Okay, so just give it a quick tap. So they load in, they have a taper. This goes into the chuck body. All right, there are different ones there. So have a look. But the C jaws is the main one that most of you are going to have. Then we're going to look at screw chuck. And the relevance will be a bit more important on this now. So screw chuck used for years. This again will load into the middle. And you'll see the relevance why I want to use this. So we do different size screws that will fit into this. Which one have I picked up? That one. I can probably undo them. Now this has got a screw that comes in from the side, an Allen key bolt. I can take this screw out. We can interchange it. Smaller one. Now we can have smaller size. I think you can probably see the difference in those. So smaller screw, smaller hole, maybe smaller bit of work. Think about the size of the workpiece you're putting on there. We also do this. I really like this. So this is a drive dog faceplate. This has, in reality, four uses. We're going to go through a few of those. So we have, obviously, the screw. We have drive dogs. We also have the aspect, if I take the drive dogs out, which I've done with this one, you can use it small faceplate. Okay, so you can screw down through the back, do that. You can use a screw chuck. What you're not meant to do is use all of it. What's a dry dog system? Well, that's a number of little spurs. So I'm going to put it in there, rattling it about to make sure I get it located nicely. In my bag here, let's have that off. We have a bit of wood. Okay, let's just do that. I'm going to turn around. I need to grab a centre. Bring that up. All right, so on a bit of wood, we have a look on four, oh, man. We've got a hole in the top of it. I'll do the pilot hole, which actually clears that screw, so I can push it onto. Not got to screw it up, so I'm using that just as a pilot hole. Now, if I've done large hollow pots or hollow forms, bigger than that one we looked at yesterday, this can be a godsend of helping me load it to lift it, get a location, slide it up. I can then bring up my tailstock. Get it located, go wherever you want this tailstock center. There's something that's going to provide a bit of pressure. Now, if I do the tailstock up, up there, I'm pushing it into those drive dogs. Now, the drive dogs, to give you a quick shot of what they are, I've got them in my hand now. Let's have a look on four, Ben. So, what they are, they screw into the back of the thing. So, these are threaded, so I can put them in, and angle right, do them up. Okay, so you can tighten them up, put them in. They have a spike that comes all the way through, pokes out the other side. That's digging into our workpiece. That's giving me a drive. Now, what's the benefit of that? It's going to do less damage than a four-prong drive. Doesn't go in as far as screwing through with, say, a space plate with screws in it. They actually, though, if I can find the start button on the low, look down low. Give me very good grip. Now, another light's going round. I can tighten things up so that we are. We've got our bowl gouge. I'm just going to drop the camera back a button. That's better. We can come from there. I'm trying to look at where I'm putting the shavings because I don't want to be putting them all over the bench that I've got stuff on. We can come along. So, this is a bit of pine with a bark head. Quite dry. So if I'm doing a hollow form with this, the top where we've got that small hole will be the top of my top, the hollowing opening hole. So I'll give you an idea, doing quite a heavy cut now. 
still getting drive, we're still getting movement, not getting any slip. So it's actually working really nicely as a system. Makes life easy. And like I said, a bit more positive than maybe a drive centre. So gently all the way along. I'll take my speed up a little bit now we balanced. A bit of arch to there. Let's have a quick look. I've made a mess now up on here. Okay, so we're rough down to something quite smooth. Now, there's no slip. There's no movement on this, which is lovely. Let's undo it a bit there first. Bring it back. Get that back out. Gently put it off. So what we got is damage in the end here. We've actually got three little holes, three little dents. But they don't go in anywhere as deep as something like a screw. So really good for that. So my hollow pot, my opening is less than that circumference. Now I know that's going to be probably one of the questions. So what do we need? Let's have a measure. Get it out of the box. Uh, come to the centre. We're there. That's about 22 mil. So 44 mil diameter. You've lost those three little holes. Those three little marks. Okay, Ben, what have you got? So Roy would like to know, um, with that uh, Morse taper adapter, he can use two Morse taper um, centers in his chuck? Yep. So any two Morse tapers. In reality, I say any any drive centers. You don't want to put a tailstock center in there because it's not going to help you. But yes, a drive center will go in. If you tap it in, and this might go back a little bit. I haven't got it up on there. Look, I put it back in the drawer. Yeah, I have. So the bottle stopper I have where we've got a few problems with, and I'm, I'm trying to sort it out for you, I promise. I've had words upstairs. That goes in. Give it a tap before you put it in there. That's going to hold it and secure it nicely when you put it on the lathe because you don't want it rattling loose. Get him out in a minute. Okay. Oh, look, I'm just going to throw on the floor. Ben's got another question. Um, F. Dale says he's got on um, the Axminster, uh, the APTC M900 lathe. Yep. In um, shape, Fred, two more taper. Okay. So he's struggling to get his drive centers out of the headstock because it's not hollow. Is there a way of um, um, getting them out? Okay. Depends on the size of the drive centers. With the lathe, and I don't know if you bought it new, there should be a Fred protector that screws on, which allows you to get them out. If you have the chrome hand wheel on the outboard side, you will need to take that off and then use a knockout bar with it. All right, so there is a chrome hand wheel that screws onto here. And if you're doing bar work, it's worth putting it on. If you're doing spindle work, it will be worth taking it off to allow you access to get through there. Okay, and I can remember the fact it has a chrome wheel. So that does unscrew and it will go the opposite direction to what you're kind of probably thinking because you've got to unscrew it from the thread. All right, so that will come off, all right? Or there are things like thread protectors you can screw on, which is an inch eight thread. Hopefully that gets over that one. Right, okay, so we've done our dry dog system. That works extremely well. I love the fact that little screw chuck you have, you know, four different uses. You get the small screw with it, the large one, the dry dogs, the face pack, lots of different options, all right? And again, that's things that we designed over the years from feedback in here. Take our chuck off on here. Into the, now with square chuck or square key chuck, so the 114, I can get away with this. Looks a bit brutal. If you're going with the 100 mil chuck, there is a chuck removal spanner. That can be worth go, going for because it actually grips on the body of the chuck. There's less risk of breaking the key on the pin, that little round bit in the chuck body. So there is a spanner that fits on it, a curved one that goes over the body of it. Okay, we're going to do these. We put these onto the chuck. One of my favourite sets of jaws. Okay. This is what I would class, and you could class as pin jaws. They replaced traditionally what was a pin chuck. A pin chuck was a round metal bar that fitted into a chuck. It had an off-centre cam section machined in. Into that, you put a metal pin, you drilled the hole in your piece of wood, 
and it allowed you in reality to mount something similar to what I'm going to do with this. So you log. So there, we'll go on to there. We can expand it in. Now, the problem with the traditional pin shot was the metal bar, as you started to cut the work, would roll over and grip the work piece, hopefully, but it tended to be wet wood. And it would expand the hole a little bit. And then it would just spin freehand. You need to obviously put your tailstock in, but that will grip there. We can expand it in and out. We can close them down. Paul and Ben. Um, so Chris would like to know, what are the optimum size drills? Sorry, the optimum size drill sizes for the, um, for the, the screw chucks, for the screws that go in the screw chucks? Okay. Sorry, I made that difficult. Do you know? I no. Okay. Best way I can kind of answer it. Digital vernier. If you measure the end of the blank on here, so that's seven, seven and a half mil would be good for the bigger screw. So I measure almost the, the blank off of the screw. All right. So I'm in between that screw thread. I can measure it with vernier. So you're looking at seven and a half mil for that. It depends on the density of the material. Okay, but seven and a half mil would work with that. In amongst my shavings somewhere up here now, there's the small one. Okay, it's probably on the floor. We'll find it. Okay, but do exactly the same for the small one. You can measure the diameter of the main shank, and it's important to get it right. Do a test run a little bit as well to check how things are going to go. The density of the material, if it's too hard and you try and force it, yes, you can snap the screw. Think about the size of what you're trying to do with it and how much weight you're trying to hang on those can be an important part. Don't go putting something too massive on it because you only held on a little screw. So we've got our pin jaws. So at the moment, we've used them for an expanding pin chuck so we could hold a natural edge bowl. Now, with these, we had the question yesterday, if I'm going to do pens, what do I drill? I use these. So we can go round one, fit it in, grip it in there. Bigger round one. Square. Okay. I'm going to use a bit of timber. Ben, Ben's got pan claws on Monday, so I promised him I'd drill a pen blank then. So staff training on Monday, so they understand about pens. First thing I would do with this, we've loaded it, we tighten the jaws down. I then use point of a skew chisel, Jason Breach oval skew, look. We can do that. I'm then going to grab tailstock drill chuck, pen drill. Put it in. I've got to bring the tailstock up just a little bit and movement-wise to make sure that the tailstock drill chuck is supported. Hmm. I'm a little bit off of there which is a little bit worrying headstock's a bit over okay that looks better now the little v in the center is going to help draw guide the drill bit central we can drill our, our jaws drill it all the way down that blank and again i'm keeping the speed nice and low we said yesterday with the lamp don't go having too much speed we need to bring it back out so i'm going to turn the lathe off Locate it by getting back in. I've come back just a bit far, so we're catching on the self eject in the tailstock. Bring it up. We're free. Stop it. Bring that out. Slower speed is better, definitely for the pen type drills as well that I've got hold of here because it will want to really pull that in rapidly. I also hold the drill check when winding forward with my left hand when it's in the tailstock. So if it does go anywhere, Nothing dramatic is going to happen with it being slower speed. I'm in control of it. So that's quite important parts. So we have our pen blank. Quick and easy, drilled free. Now, smaller stuff. That long. Tail, tail rest can go in. We can get nicely in around this. So we can do a stalk for a bit of throat. Now, the reason I like this, I've got access to put my left hand nicely in here. Okay. 
sit on the tourist and come into there, my stew. So there, I'm going to take the speed up. I can even use my thumb in underneath and my fingertip, look, just to support it. One. Right, I'm off. We can feed it out. So with this, I could feed actually due to the fact this is hollow headstock all the way through. So I've got that rapid access of getting in and out of here. So fingertips of support. Quick and easy to do, isn't it? Now, a lot more access in there than something like the engineering type step jaws. There's more access for my hand to position on the tourist to get into here nicely and safely. So they will do that bit. Hang on, Ben. Let me just do the last one. Then, then you can have your question. Say you've got something that you've already turned or is a bit delicate and you don't want to mark it. So you might want some soft top type jaws. So I just go camera one place. Now I'm really in trouble now because I put a coffee cup into the room. Now Ben knows what this is. Now to make your soft top jaws is going to cost you nothing. But don't go down the allotment and, and help yourself. I know it's just lying about and it's there. So what can we use? Hose pipe. What's in the cup? A bit of warm water just softens it up. Put them on. Go on to there. They slide on really nicely. They grip nicely. Allows me to put something that I might have that's already been turned into there. Grip it nicely. Hold it. I can do whatever I want. You can even, if you want, expand into something. I don't know what I've got here. Something we're going to use in a minute and grip it using the soft top on the outside. So very versatile again, something quite unique. Only question I've ever had with this is how do you get those back off? Because they cool down a bit. Um, what you need to do is get an oval skew onto there. Pull them in. Now, in the middle of the jaw, there's a hollow grind round hole where the bolt hole is. So I line up with that. Gives me enough leverage just to slide them off. Don't leave them on there long term. The jewels now are stainless steel, so no, they won't rust. Okay, good. So we've done pin type jewels. Very versatile, very useful. Pen blanks, small stuff, natural edge bowls. Again, one of those things at home that definitely can't live without. I'm going to put that in my basket. Come on, then, Ben, what you got? Um, so Martin would like to know um, how to avoid the drill wandering off centre when um, when drilling on the lathe. Okay, my best tip I can give you, and you watched it, me do it. Anything that I want to use a drill bit with onto the lathe in the tower stocks, I bring it up. I make a centre mark, a small V. Point of a skew chisel will really help. The other thing I did was definitely with this lathe, because it has swing head, make sure they line up. That's quite important. But that simple tip of actually just doing a center drill hole, if you like, using the tip of a skew chisel, letting the tourist will help guide the drill bit into that center. Don't go too deep. Lip and spur drills are a bit better. They reduce the bust out on the bottom end. Okay. Hoping that helps on there, Ben. And then um, I think talking about the Morse, cape, the Morse taper carrier that fits in the C jaws, yep. is, is that going to fit on other chucks? I, I suppose it's um, designed it's for our seed the same size. Now, I open it and I've just reached for something because sensibly, and you could look at this on the web, what you need to do is look at the seed as we do, and there's a description of them, okay, in the catalogue or on the web. Look at the sizes, measure your jaws, you have your Nova. These are just designed to fit in underneath. There is a lip on the seed jaws, so this catches in underneath. 
So that could be the restriction point, but yes, you might get away with it. But you need to check the sizes because this relates to the size of RC jaws. Okay, so the diameter, it grips all the way around. It goes back in reality to what I said about with that surface contact area. All right, Ben? We, just remember, we said we weren't going to have lots of questions. We've got <laughs> loads to get through. Okay. Um, so, dancers with ad bucks would like to know um, if you've got pin jaws, yep. do you need pen jaws? <laughs> okay. I didn't tell you. Don't tell anyone else. All right. No, I I go with my pin jaws over pen jaws because they're more versatile for what I want. Okay. Ben's got no, no. All right. Okay. Good. Now working along my line. Oh, God, it's getting a mess up here now. Right, we're going to change things a little bit. Let's just move the tool rest out a little bit. Oh. This thing. Let's give you the aspect of what this does. Um, over the years, I've made quite a few of these. Can we get a camera four? It's quite good, Ben, actually. So I make a mirror bowl. It has a ball. Those of you that know me, I make lots of wooden balls. This isn't meant to go together. This is two different woods, but it shows you the aspect that the ball has to be a ball or it won't sit on the center pedestal. Nothing difficult to make. But I like to turn the ball first. Now, if you want to know how we did that, we turned the ball the same way we did it when we did the ball clock and the solitaire balls ages ago. Go back to the Woodwork and Wisdom page. So on here, this is my, my chuck to hold it, because once I've actually made the ball, it's round, I need to be able to recess the mirror and put it in. So I use a donut chuck. So my donut chuck in here, let's fish things about so you can see, see what we've got. Underneath here, I have screw, uh, face plate ring. Under there, a piece of kitchen worktop as a board to work on. Something in the center to hold it. This was just screwed on from the other side. I can have... The kitchen towel or something in the center when I'm prepping this up. Let's see if I can bring that back a bit more. That looks better. The ball would go in. You've got to remember at this point there's no mirror in it. So how about we turn it over? Have this. So I use plywood and threaded rod. So I would work out the size as I want. I can have these. So these will go down through there. Find my hole. Okay. Okay, so this is making up things to suit. So one there, one out here, one on here. So this has three, wrong way, bolt holes. I've only put in the one in just to save us time. And I tighten them down equally. I've measured from the side down to the bottom, all the way around. On the back, on the underside here, where the thread goes through, you've obviously put a nut. You tighten them up, clamp it in place. That allows me access to turn whatever I want here. All right, so you donut chuck something you can make. A couple of bits of threaded rod, some plywood, quite easy to do. Over the years, I've made different collars. They do different tasks, different things, but quite easy to do. This donut chuck, I don't know, I bet it's 20, 25 years old. Gets used occasionally, gets put out of the way, stored. When I need it, it's indispensable. Quick and easy ways of solving problems that I can't do with some of the other stuff we're going to look at. So we've done our donut chuck. Let's put our ball out of the way, put him back on there. Even this little thing was donut chuck. Because I need to turn the ball, and then this is another box. Some of you that came to wizardry know that the, I have these on the table. These unscrew, so you've got an off-center hollowing. A bit tricky to do, but done with a donut chuck. Ben? So a question from Maria. Um, she says it's a great chuck, but it, it's big. Um, is there a way of holding the same size turned ball on a smaller diameter chuck? Sorry, is there a way of holding a... A way of holding a, a similar sized ball on a, um, on a smaller diameter chuck. So you've got to remember, you can make your donut chuck to fit your life. Okay. Now, Maria, your lathe, you've probably got record number one, two. You've got a 12-inch swing. This is only 12-inch diameter. So my plywood, I'll mark out. And actually, the plywood, when I put these on, it will be easier actually to drill down through, especially where the center is, and mark your lines. You could screw them onto the board. You could put a face plate on the center bit that you're going to cut out. And I load them onto 
that's the hole. Bolt it together. And then turn the reset out once I've done that bit. So it gives me a way of, I drill these all at the same time. Once you've done the initial drilling, if you use something thicker, like I've used the kitchen workshop, this becomes your template guide to drill down through. So I flip it over, clamp it together, drill down through, and through the plywood. So it gives you a template as well. All right, so they can be whatever size you like. Don't go thinking it's got to be massively big. You can put them onto a faceplate. You can use them with a faceplate ring. And that's where faceplate rings become so versatile because you can put it back on the chat quick and easily without too much expense. Ben? Marcus would like to know uh, what what width threaded rod did you use? Threaded rod? You can buy metric threaded rod very easily, okay, especially in the UK. So the guys in the States, you can buy it. It can be whatever you like as long as you can get nuts or fittings. Other thing occasionally I will use is a T-bolt, which has a round head with an Allen key fitting. That can be useful, but it depends on the length, okay? But I tend to buy it as long lengths and then cut what I need. I can show you a good way of doing that in a minute, okay? All right, Ben? <laughs> okay, right. Okay. Ooh, we'll do, do that first. So wood plates. Now, most of you, and they're down here, look. Oh! Just going to put these on the live. Okay, I think if I come back, where am I there? That's that. So we put a set of wood plates on. I think, Ben, if you go to the good lad, he knows where he's heading. All right, I'm going to bring that in a bit. So our wood plate jaws, very versatile. We have a mounting jaw, a metal segment. You can get different sizes of metal segment. So there is a smaller, which I think is 100 mil off the top of my head. There's a bigger one, which is 150 mil, so six inch diameter. These screw on. If you're going to buy these, buy spare mounting jaws, because once you screw them on, you don't want to be taking them on and off. So leave them on there. Your number's obviously on the end. It makes it easy to get to. You can then create whatever you want as a recess. And you can also create these to fit your lathe again. So if you've got 12 inch swing, you can make a set 12 inch. My lathe at home has a 20 inch swing. So I have, yeah, I've got a big set that but I don't always want them on there. Smaller ones can be really versatile. Now, most of us use these and they're great if you think back to when we did our thin bowl project and we did that bowl. I mean, bell shape, a bit thinner. Due to the fact I've got my recess, camera four for me, Ben. Okay, I can put this into whatever recess I like. So I can bring that out a bit, fit into there, it'll hold it. Now, the jewelry with this as a setup, it grips it all the way around, but I cut the recesses to suit the bowl. So gradually, I might wear these out. Plywood is the best thing to make them out of, and I mean good quality plywood. Don't go using MDF. It doesn't support it. It tends to flare and fall apart like cardboard. So MDF doesn't work. <laughs> the recess that these are cut into, I make a little bit of dovetail shape. So easiest way with that. Tip of your skew chisel, angle back, a bit like you do a dovetail on the recess at the bottom of a bowl. Exactly the same way. That means that it's encased in under that lip and pulling towards the headstock as I tighten it down. If you buy bigger sets of these, like we've got on here, you need longer chuck key because you won't get the clearance of the bar off the side body of, all right? So if it's too small, you're not going to clear it. So somewhere over here and amongst this chaos that I now have, we have standard key. I can't turn it now because there's not enough length to it to clear the work piece. So you need a longer key for this. That's quite important. But I can grip that. And do you think it grips it all the way around? It doesn't squash it or distort it. Okay? We can run things. It'll hold it. So wood plate jaws, really indispensable. But I started to think about what can you do with wood plate jaws. Now, I'm just going to take this off the line. You've got an idea. We've seen you do that. You've seen Colwyn do his jewelry thing how oh, ben oh. gonna put them back down out the way so my little box here i'm gonna say what do you mean a box right square as a cube 
Each face was hollowed and then decorated. All right. Wow. So how do we hold it? Wood plates. They don't have to be round. So in reality, apart from it's fiddly to do on the light bed, but it gives you the best option. That's how I can hold each face. So I make a box like I normally would, keeping it square, put it in here, dish it out, do the decoration. The damage around the edge here was to allow access for the router cutter to get in. So the texture or the texture really is added with a router cutter. But I needed some way of holding it and allowing me to skim and hollow each face, turn it round. All right, these are MDF because I can glue and screw these together because they have a set task. Other important thing, if you're going to do anything like this, the bolts, I bolt all the way down through the layer of MDF, through the wood plate, into the mounting jaw, and then screw this on, because there's a lot more support by having the bolts above going through the material as a baseboard to grip it. There's a lot of pressure involved in this when you clamp this down either side, wants to push this apart. So by bolting it directly through the timber into the mounting jaw, you've got a lot more structural strength. Okay, something quite different. So you don't think the mounting or your wood plates have got to be a round object. You can make them to suit certain projects. All right, okay. Ben's got his hand up again. Let's see what you got. Um, so for your um, your donut, Chuck, yep. um, would a bit of router matting in the bottom um, give you some Definitely. extra grip? So I use, so you could use router mat now, even with, and we didn't kind of show you because I know I'm pushing time, look. Put that one there. Things we've done. Big vase. Nice, isn't it? Grass tree root. Lovely colour. On there. So I made a cone that sat on here. I can have matting that sits on there that goes on. I can have a collar. That allowed me to turn this bottom shape on the foot because it was originally straight. And it allows me to do things that are almost impossible. Some of you are going to say, oh, I've got vacuum chuck. I've got a vacuum chuck. And on things like this, occasionally, if I vacuum chuck them, I end up with a four-part vessel. In other words, it blows it up. So controlling that vacuum can be quite an important part. Donut chuck, quite easy to make. And once I've made the initial board, I can make as many colors as I like to fit on. Ben. Uh-oh. Go read this one. He's studying this carefully. So we're just I'm just trying to pull time for him while he's reading it. Okay. Um, so I was just trying to find the question. Um, it was about the um the square chuck. Um, it only had two jaws on it. Is that okay? Okay. So with this, due to the fact I want to hold a square, I found it easier to cut a right angle on here and then grip. I found if I had four when I mailed it, they'd want to push back a bit more. This gave me more structural strength to hold it and do the work. It also acts like a clamp, pushing things together and getting the pressure, if you like, pushing from one side into the other, gave me more grip. So yeah, that will work. And the joy of this is, if you do two for something like this, you've got two more you can build another one with, <laughs> okay? Great, that was from Malcolm. Sorry, I couldn't find his name then. All right, okay. All right, so we've done those. We've done wood plates. And like I said, lots of different sizes. Button jaws, one of my favorite things. Now, people say, but you've got wood plates. I use both, depending on what I'm making. So, simple bowl would have had straight foot got a held in the chuck somewhere i wanted rounded bottom it is thick enough to take the pressure of being pushed and distorted not like my bell shaped thin bowl that will distort with the buttons pushing in certain areas so this i can put in tighten it down grip it in place doesn't get any distortion so quite easy to do okay um, gives me something rounded on the bottom. It will wobble nicely as a bowl. I love this, okay? It's a peanut bowl for people that when they come around, I don't want them having too many. So I think it, just, okay? Ben, when you get when you get yourself back together, okay? Next question, come. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions about your box. There's a lot of love for your box. Um, 
The first question is uh, is from Maria. Um, how did you separate the lid um, on your square box? Did you part it off or did you saw it? I did bandsaw cut to start with whilst it's still a square block. And then you do a parting cut to create the lip to join the two together. Okay. So it's got recess. Now, if you went back to the basic boxes that we did on Woodwork and Wisdom, exactly the same fitting, but a little bit more difficult because it's square. Okay. But I started with a bandsaw instead of parting tool. If you go with parting tool, you're more likely to chip the corners on entry. Bandsaw will give you a better result because you've got a nice sharp blade. Okay. And then uh, Dances with Aardvarks would like to know, um, how did you do the decorations? Done with a router cutter. And that's another demo. So not today. Not today. Come on. I just, all right, okay. So we, we saw it at some point. All right, now. So button jaws, we kind of said you've got that bit. Now, well, there are three sizes of these. So unlike your wood plates, you're a bit more restricted on what you can buy. So in other words, we do a six inch. I think there's a 10 inch and then a 16 inch. Wood plates, you can make whatever size you like to suit your lathe. So we've done those ones. Ooh, and these have got the rubber buttons. So the rubber buttons compress, they give, they flex a little bit. So they don't damage the workpiece. We can position them anywhere. Move them about, we can grip them, okay? I've even done things though, where I do that. So what we got there, we have a mounting jaw, slightly smaller bolt. I think this is M4, not M5, so I needed to find a different bolt. Countersunk as well, so it pulls into the center. A couple of washers in underneath, because there is the step on the jaw here, where, which you can see there, where the jaw that sits on the top locates. So there's that groove that sits into. So I've got two washers underneath and then the rubber jaw. Four of those into the chuck with nothing else on allows me to hold things like my little donut okay i think you can see that so if you can imagine four of those it allows me to shape things like the inside turn it over sand it the initial holding would be either screw chuck or things like the o'donnell jaws so i've already drilled a hole in the blank load it but that was a way of giving me a quick and easy option of gripping something without that massive weight of everything spinning around because that's there Let's bring the board back in and get back to colour. So, don't be there. No one there, no one there, that one there. You can open and close them. You've got a really small set of four little buttons. So it'll grip soft stuff or stuff that you've already turned that you don't want to damage just to support it, finish it off. Fantastic way of doing it. But we don't think about using the mounting jaws as a base for holding things. Why not? Like I said, you need an M4 countersunk screw. It does own screws. I was worried about having to say to the bank, can you go find the screwdriver, which I know where it is. You can't leave that desk, though. On here, are we doing 53? So two washers, rubber, but okay. So that's an option. Okay. Bigger set. Oh, bring that back a bit. Now on here, and I've got to just finish setting this up. I can see I haven't got, got a piece of tulip wood. I've got to screw these in. I'm going to put one in. I don't know why I had them like that. I'll take this one off as well. I've labelled the holes. We're using something different. So bigger set of button jaws. Carefully put the screws down there. Have these things. These are called stackers. Okay. They stack together. So I can double them up. Go that way around. They get a bit. So I can join them. I can put the screw down for the middle. Now these are a primary gripping device. A face plate or screw chuck is a primary gripping device. So we can put these on. Now I've labeled where they need to be, look. A couple of black dots. Do those up. So with something like my bit of tulip wood, I can put them into there, hopefully. Do it up. 
it'll grip into the side. Yes, it'll mark it just a little bit. We need some access. We don't need that. To there. Next thing you need to do, take the leg speed down because this is a little bit bigger. Have some fun in a minute. Ben. I'm, I'm going to do some turning. I'm getting withdrawal symptoms from not playing over here. So we can do something on there. So I've got spindle gear out right on edge. We could do have a think. Little hollow in there. Follow in there. Grab a few tools. Take the speed down. Hermie Taylor decorating out. On there. Skew chisel. With a little bit more speed so we get a bit more cut. On there. There. It's a bit chippy on that one. Now I'm trying to be quick again for this. Not the one I want, but it'll probably work. I hung it back on the wall, I think so. So a bristle brush. Short bristle will be better than what I've got here. So the decorating else comes with a short bristle brush. First stage. Okay. Come on then, Ben. Let's have a look. You've got it, so, okay. So we've got shorter bristles on here. It'll help clean that up. I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to push what we're doing a bit, guys. Now, we can move things about. And that sounds weird, doesn't it? But what I've got to think about is where do I want to be? Let's see what happens if we come to there. So what I'm doing now, really, moving the buttons about. Go to there. Now we make hand mirrors and things like this, so don't think it's got to be what we're doing now. I want to give you the aspect that you can actually... Move things over. Pin them in there. So I'm just turning it round. Take the speed down again because we've moved this off centre. What did we have in the centre of the other one? A dome, didn't we? So... A hollow in the middle here. We can I think we're going to come out to there. So I think you're starting to see what we can achieve. Now let's do one other thing. Because at the moment we can lose this one, I hope. We take this one back out. Take the screw at the centre, double this up. Put it back in. We lose that one. That one out. Get the screw out, put it in with the wood shavings. I can see it as I tighten it back up. What does that do? Well, we can actually now. Ooh, can we go camera free, Ben? Please. Tilt it. Look at the gap I've got up on here now. Whereas the centre is flat. So 
So we can grip off centre, you could grip two degrees from a regular shape. Now with this, let the speed up a little bit. Got to get to where they're going to touch. That's good. So we'll only hit the outside edge. Again, we'd go our brush, a bit ragged out there, but it'd be okay. If we went to the middle, we can make a more solid. Let's try here. So this line, where were we? There. Drops in nothing at this point. Nothing on the other because we can tilt it. So your stackers have quite an interesting use that you can actually move stuff about, move it off center. You can also tilt it by stacking them together, which gives you more hold. So I do things like mirrors with these. Okay. Oh, last thing. Call it Chuck. Junior Chuck. Okay. So what does this have? This has a nut. Let's see if I can get in a bit more on here. That's better, look. You have a collet that comes out. All right. We have different size collets. Then can you go back to main camera just for a sec? You might have and this is what I said to you about this yesterday. Think about this. So on here, this is the lamp auger we used yesterday. That long hole, okay? I can undo this. I could take the collet out here. It's exactly the same type of collet, an ER collet. So I could have that one out. If you've got interchangeable bowl gouge handle, so you've got your bowl gouge, and do this. The collet in here. I could use exactly the same collet. So in reality, the whole of that system with the little junior chuck and anything that has those collets, you can interchange. Why is that so versatile? What are you going to do with it? Okay, simple thing then. Let's put it back together for a second. Just going to put it in. I've got to clip that into the nut. Go on, Ben, what you got where I'm um, fiddling around with? Panicking. Um, so dancers with aardvarks would like to know um, what's the overall length of the junior chuck okay all right let me just do then because i want to get a rod through there wrong size call it jason that one on there thought that was difficult to do so right, i put a too small a collar in for what i was trying to achieve it was never going to fit the collets have about a millimeter movement so i can tighten this up grip it Overall length from there to the front, 80 mil. Okay, so 80 millimeters from the back to the front. It is 55.92 in diameter. And if you really want, uh, 78.12 millimeters. Okay, but that's it. Okay, so if you say 80 mil will be good, but that allows me to grip something here. Now, my piece of ash dowel, we use these for the chair course, I can move in and out. So I could depend on where I want to do it. I might want to sand it. We When we used to do the chair courses, regularly used to sand that. It will grip round things better. We can easily change the collars. Let's go back to the middle one we had. Put it in there, loaded. If I can do it up again. Conical cup we used yesterday. We could put that in. Tie it up. Ring center one. Mini faceplate, if you like. Um, okay, just undo that. Gonna take the one back out. Put this one in. This is smaller. I think this is six mil. We could put a little bobbin sander. Or... All right. 
Now, if you've tried doing this thing with normal chuck, first of all, you've lost that big diameter around here. If you think about normal size chuck, oh, massive. So it's quite a big size to have in the background. Quite nice that this is out of the way, smaller, more compact. If you try this with your drill chuck, it wobbles loose when you're using it. And then you have to try and catch it. That's a little bit embarrassing. Ben sat at me, looking at me, giving me funny. So the joy with this is I can easily, okay, if I tighten up enough, I think the nut's spinning on my back. Yeah, okay. But we can stand. What have you said about threaded rod? Just going to do this, Ben, all right? I will get to. Now, the joy with this, if you get your hacksaw, give me two, Ben. I put my piece of threaded rod in. Now, if any of you try cutting threaded rod, it's not difficult, it's not hard. If you put it in a metal vice, you run the risk you squash the thread a bit. It doesn't work. It tends to chew it up. If you put it into a drill chuck and try and hold it, similar things. So I found the best way. I can put it on there. I could even lock the spindle on the lathe. But to get this grip in it all the way round, as I call it, I can cut through. So I'm using it, if you like, out as a vice. No, don't go having the lathe running when you do this. We can take it out. I can't throw it on the floor. Next thing you might want to do is deburr it. Little pad sander. Velcro things like Carl Wind uses for us. Okay, we can put it in there. And there, take the burr edge off there. Nice and simple, isn't it? You might want to sand your bit of wood on here. I don't know. But it's held it, and again, it's nice and small and compact. Come on, let's have your question. I can do the last little bit. Um, so does the Chris would like to know, does the collet mark the timber? No. The collet is actually really forgiving and a bit like it's difficult to show you. Let's see. <laughs> Wrong one. Okay. The collets. If you have a router, you'll know that the collets tend to be, if I can get my hand in the right way, that's good. I'm gone. Camera free now, go on. That's the collet. So it's spring loaded. Your workpiece is pushed down. Now, all of these clothes, this is an engineering type way of holding stuff. So they grip all the way around. So it won't mark the wood. So if you're using lots of things, and if you think Colwyn's been doing lots of stuff with the dowel, really good for that. Because you can feed your dowel through the headstock if you've got hollow headstock. I won't go through at the moment because I've got the wrong collet in. You can interchange the collets as we've said really similar. I'm going to leave it on there. But you saw me feed it through. Quick and easy to do. You can feed it through the back of the chuck. Nice and easy to work with. Won't mark it because it's gripping it all the way around. Unlike something like the drill chuck where you get the free teeth on it, or even my pin jaws, they will grip it, but they mark in the center because you get the four corner points. Uh, in the box, okay. Come on, Ben, what's the other question? Um, so I've got a question from Pete here. He'd like to know where he's going to get all the money from to buy all this new kit he new now needs. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is things that over the years have regularly built up. Now... Other weird and wonderful thing, and Ben loved this when I showed this, flexible drive shaft. Now, I use these quite a bit at home. So I've got a sanding pad in here. I can have six mil collet. Tighten this up. Camera one, Ben. Let's have a look. Um, now, there might be the scenario, and some of you will have looked at this as a thing. You've got a bowl that you want to do something to sandwise. I can put a pad sander on there. You could use your electric drill, but it's hard work. Other thing I can do here, to the fact I've got variable speed lathe, I can control that speed nicely. I can sit down. So actually in my workshop at home, I regularly get this out and sand things up a bit. I can control the speed more. It's not as violent. I can work on a specific area. So really useful just to do that. Move on a bit. All right. And with it being on the lathe, you're still using what you've got as machinery. Put your, your finger, your flexible drive shaft in there, on, off. I can take the speed up a bit. I'll get the dial a bit right. We can move around. You could do your bobbin sander in here. whole range of things. But it makes the lathe really adaptable to what you're doing. And all we're using is the collet. 
you could put drill bits in there. So anything that's round will fit directly into that collet and you can tighten up. Some of you might have, let's go main camera then, Ben. Small mini proxim one, flexible drive. Again, you could have a three mil shank. You could do your sanding in here because I find most of the variable little units this goes into, they run too fast. You burn the abrasive too quick or you overheat it. So smaller collet, that will go in. I can use the flexible drive unit, really good for that. And you keep the speed down by controlling it on your variable speed lag, if you've got a variable speed lag. But your label runs slower than some of the variable units that you're putting this onto, the proxons, that sort of thing, the Dremels. Okay. Right. Quick term. Oh, the only thing I haven't done, this thing. Just go back to, this is a real simple one. I'm just looking on the bench. This is just a little foam pad. So Colwyn's board that he has with the router mat on. This is just a curved face one. So if you've got something you want to put inside as a neck or a bowl, again, I use things like that as a reversing pad. Bring the tail stuck up. So all I've done is stuck the foam down with some uh, compact adhesive and designed it to fit in a set of jaws. Dead easy to do, okay? Adapting things to do certain tasks. Oh my God, right, okay. That's all right. Ben saw the list of stuff that we brought in earlier to do this with and went, you're never going to do that. Um. Any more questions, Ben? Have you got them there? I'm sorry, guys, if it seems rough. If you have questions on this, email us. Um, comments on the one more type of stuff I've taken on board. Again, email me on things on that. I'm looking into trying to see what we can do. All right. I am. Um, I've been upstairs. Uh, I could be if I'm not in for a few weeks. You know what happened. All right, but I'll be here. Um, Hope you've enjoyed it. Give me a few ideas in the last few days of how you can adapt your lathe and do certain things, all right? I know, okay, bad, all right. But you can adapt it to do certain tasks. Video yesterday, lots of different things. This was more chucks, face plates, explaining the basics of your chuck. Simple thing, right? Like even that gripping error is so important to get right. And I regularly see people overextending the jaws, trying to grip something. And you're gripping on such a small amount and you're getting vibration. I'm not surprised. Hardly touching anything. It's amazing on how much you get there. Constant in between. Stupid little things that we all do. I know, you don't want to buy another set of jaws. Or, but jaws don't bend just because you change the diameter of your workpiece. Real simple little one. Come on then, Ben, what have you got? Oh, it's just, um, it's gone off screen because there's so many people saying well done and, and great demo. Um, just give us a moment. Um, where are we? So a uh, question from Jim B. Um, can we just have the name of the chuck again that's or, that's on so the lathe at the moment? The chuck on here is classed as a junior chuck. Now, at the moment, from what I can see, and I had a look yesterday, and I'm, I've kind of mentioned a few things about this, it's only 33 by 3.5 as a spindle thread. We used to do 3 quarters, 16, and inch 8. I will see what I can do because I'd like to get those back on there because it's so adaptable for certain tasks, even things like the flexible drive shaft, holding smaller things, drill bits, sanding pads, safely, quick and easily as well. So I'll see what I can do, all right? But junior chuck, all right? And you get lots, you know, put different collets in there. It comes with three collets. There is a range from 1 to 2 mil up to, I think, 13 mil is the maximum on that. Any other comments, Ben? Anything else? No? Okay. So, guys, thank you all very much. Thank you for being patient. I hope it hasn't been too much of a rush. Enjoy your turning. Give us a thumbs up. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.